Today, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper. I started thinking about this Monday morning early. And uh, I pray that we understand what Christ did for us. I pray we never just go through the motions of taking the Lord's Supper. It's a memorial service. It's where He loved us so much that He gave Himself for us. It's a reminder of the price that was paid. And as we look at the Lord's Supper today, I want to go back and forth from the Old Testament to the New Testament and uh, hopefully you will understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it's very, very important that we understand this as Christians. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And today I'd like to share with you Jesus, the New Covenant. And if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, number one, a perfect priest. A perfect priest. Jesus was. Number two, a perfect sacrifice. The perfect Lamb of God. I hope you understand, folks. I sin every day. Jesus lived 33 years and never sinned. Never. In a perfect covenant. These three things I want you to see today. The Old Covenant found in the Old Testament was divinely inspired by God, but was only temporary. Its purpose was to show mankind what was to come, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The first sanctuary was a cloth tent called the tabernacle. It, tr it truly shows a portrait of Jesus Christ. Everywhere you look in the tabernacle, you could see Jesus from the holy place to the Holy of Holies, from the altars to the lampstands, from the sacred bread to the mercy seat, from Aaron's rod to the Day of Atonement, God was showing himself and the future work of Jesus Christ to his chosen people, Israel. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions of sin. Our text today will show you the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And remember, a covenant is a promised agreement, a last will and testament. God made the original covenant with Abram in Genesis chapter 2. And in your bulletin, you will see a handout. I hope you got that, and I want you to pull it out just for a, a few minutes. I want to hit this quickly so that we can get to our text, but it's important uh, that you see how it was. He gave, God gave specific instruction to Moses, and Aaron was the first high priest, and he gave them exactly the dimensions, exactly what needed to be on the inside, and he gave him what each thing meant. And you'll see at the bottom, it's called the holy place. And uh, the veil was in two places. There was a veil as you go in. And by the way, there's no, no windows in here at all. It would be pitch black if, if you went in there uh, without the lighting of the candlesticks. And the priest only, okay, just the priest, the Levites, could go into the holy place. And if you see on the right there, you see the table of showbread. And on that table was the... 12 loaves of bread, and it symbols the 12 tribes of Israel, and it is a reminder of the provision that God had for the children of Israel. On the left side was the candlestick, and they were more like lamps because they had uh, wicks, and part of the priestly duties uh, was to keep them maintained. But that candlestick, or those candlesticks, lit up the first part of the holy place. Then if you look above that, you'll see the incense altar. Twice a day in morning and evening, the priest would come in 
and they would offer the sacrifice of incense. And these uh, were the prayers of sending to, uh, sending to God from God's people. Then if you look at the top part, the holies of holies, one time a year, the high priest would go into the holy of holies. And uh, no one else could, not even another priest could go in there. And in the holy of holies was where God dwelt. The light was the Shekinah glory of God that lit that place up. And if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, it was wooden and had a lid on it, and it all was laid in gold. Much of what I said today, all of that was uh, laid in gold. But in the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, uh, the golden jar manna and Aaron's rod. And the mercy seat was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and it was made of gold. And also the cherub at each end, they were angel-like. And that one day, he would take the blood sacrifices, and he would pour the sacrifice on the mercy seat of God, and that would roll back man's sin uh, for one year. And, it, and that was the way it was set up. It was a good way. It was God's way. But the New Testament and Jesus' birth brought something totally new. And I want to give you five facts about the Old Covenant sanctuary. Number one, it was an earthly sanctuary. Okay, It was a man-made tent, basically. Okay, Even though it was nice, uh, it was set up for mankind, it was man-made. Number two, it was a type of something greater to come. And we know that greater one is Jesus Christ. Number three, it was inaccessible to people. And folks, when we think of the sanctuary, we are in a sanctuary, and you are sitting in a sanctuary. But back then, the people could not go inside the holy place and could not go into the holy of holies. Number four, it was temporary. Temporary. There was going to be a permanent dwelling place, and I'll share that with you in just a few minutes. And number five, its ministry was external and not internal. The blood sacrifice was external. And here's the key. You need to understand that. The Old Testament sacrifice covered sin. It covered sin, but the new covenant through Jesus' blood cleansed sin cleansed it. The, the old covenant was on the outside, the external part. The new covenant, I am telling you, God cleanses us from our sin at the point of salvation. So with that in mind, let's look at Hebrews 9, verse 11. A perfect priest. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a, with a greater and more, more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. And folks, he says, but Christ came as the high priest. He is our high priest. He's at the right hand of God. He is interceding for you and I. He prays for you and I. We don't have to confess our sins to a mere man. Okay? Even the high priest in those days, he had to have a sacrifice and a blood, uh, blood, put blood on the altar uh, before he could go into the Holy of Holies or he would have been struck dead right on the spot. So we, we as Christians, can go straight to God. It opened the door for communication with God in Jesus Christ. Our high priest is Jesus. And when it talks about uh, the good things to come, it was Jesus Christ. And you have to re remember, those who died before the cross, Old Testament folks, they had to believe in a coming Messiah. We know it happened. We can even prove it through history. 
But the key in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, is faith. These Old Testament men and ladies had faith in God. And they were counted as righteousness because of their faith in God. With a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. And you see, as I said, in the Old Covenant, the holies of holies, was where the presence of God is. Now we know where the presence of God is. It's in heaven. It's heaven. We will end up as Christians in heaven. Heaven is a perfect place. Jesus Christ was a perfect God-man. Jesus Christ had never sinned, and He is. Notice the capital, High Priest, capital H, capital P. And we have to understand that the the first tabernacle was made by man's hands, which means also it's temporary. But God made heaven. God created heaven for uh, for His children. Then verse 12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And we know the blood of goats and calves uh, in the Old Testament. That was the way God ordained it. That was the way He said it was. But you had to keep sacrificing and keep sacrificing and killing the bullock and keep killing the lambs and over and over again. But Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, He shed His blood for you and I. And His blood covers sin. His blood cleanses us inside from sin. And it says, having obtained eternal redemption. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. Folks, it it wasn't that we were sick in sin. We were dead in sin. The only hope we had is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it says, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't give enough. It is God's riches at Christ's expense. And look at verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. When you were saved, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you look at it spiritually, spiritually, We as Christians are already there. We're there. God made the covenant with us. God promised us if we would trust in Him, He would take us to heaven. And so we see that Jesus Christ is in heaven. Jesus Christ is our salvation. Look at verse 7, that in the ages to come, that He may show the exceeding riches of His grace, in His kindness toward us, in Jesus Christ. God loves you so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. Jesus loved you so much that He gave His life for you. And look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of yourselves, but it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Oh, folks, it's all about Jesus. Salvation is Jesus. It is Jesus. So we see the perfect priest. The second thing I want you to see is a perfect sacrifice. A perfect sacrifice. Look in verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, 
cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. And we have to understand that the animal sacrifices, I mean, when you think of the amount of animals that died, you think about uh, all you know, the animals that died, and we look at animal sacrifices. Animal sacrifices came before the cross. Animal sacrifices couldn't save you. Animal sacrifices could not change a man's heart. And so we see here, and you think of the sacrifices and the ashes of a heifer, the difference between that, the two things was uh, the ashes of the heifer, if someone went and got near a dead person or even touched a dead person, they were unclean till they offered the animal sacrifice. In the sprinkling of unclean sanctifies uh, for the purifying of the flesh. Folks, I am telling you, that's the difference. The flesh in the Old Testament, the Spirit in the New Testament. When Jesus Christ came and lived, and even after His death, the Spirit of God was that dunamis, was that power in that church. So he is basically saying, and Steve, we sung about that, oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Folks, I cannot tell you how important the blood of Jesus is. It is everything. It is everything. And notice what verse 14 says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offer himself without spot to God? Folks, Jesus willingly went to the cross. Jesus willingly gave his life. Jesus' blood paid for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he is God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. You think, you, you think of some of the worst sins there are, folks. The, the sins, and there's some, uh, they're just atrocious for me even to think of them. That sin was laid on Jesus Christ. He willingly paid his life, and gave his blood for our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And folks, I am telling you, Jesus' blood paid for our sin, and the only reason we are righteous, the only way we are righteous is putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. See, he died that day on the cross. But three days later, folks, he arose from the grave. Amen. That's what Easter Sunday is about. But do you realize that we can have Easter Sunday every Sunday? We can go into the Holy of Holies. We can come and worship our Lord and Savior. We can say thank you, God. We can say thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. And it talks there about the eternal spirit. Folks, I'm telling you, that is what tells you when you do something wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. We don't have to go to a man we don't have to confess our faults to any man. We go directly to the throne of God. We go directly, directly to Jesus Christ. And He forgives us of our sins. And it says, and cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Folks, I am telling you, the only way we can have peace with God the only way that we can know is through the Holy Spirit. 
And that Holy Spirit cleanses us. It cleans us. It makes us aware of our sin so that we can confess that sin and be right with Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verse 11. Just flip over one page. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, and notice man is, is capitalized, man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Folks, we know that in, even in studying in Revelation, Jesus is at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he is perfected forever those are be, who are being sanctified. Now, oh, folks, we never arrive spiritually. We never arrive spiritually. But, folks, I thank God for the forgiveness of sin. I could not live another day without the forgiveness of sin of sin. And God, through His Son Jesus Christ, made us a way to be right with God. Folks, the world is looking for this one word. And that's, this is why our world is so messed up, folks. They are looking for peace. But they cannot find peace unless they know the Prince of Peace. So folks, we need to Thank God for that perfect sacrifice that Jesus was on the cross for our sins. So we see the perfect priest. We see a perfect sacrifice. And the last thing is we see a perfect covenant. A perfect covenant. Look at verse 15. And for this reason, He is the mediator of the new covenant. Oh, folks, Jesus Christ is the bridge that we cross from our old self. We cross over to our new nature, which is in Jesus Christ. He mediates for us. And I know even times in my own life, I know probably more than once, Jesus, I mean, God has looked at Jesus and Jesus has said, hey, give that knucklehead Franklin a break, okay? He's yours. He loves you. He's serving you. He wants to be right with you. Folks, there's no better feeling than to know your soul is well and to be right with God. Jesus is our mediator, our mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. And again, folks, his death paid for our sins that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, folks, we all have to come the same way. Everybody is going to stand before God. Everybody is going to give an account of their life to God. And I am telling you, if you are saved, Jesus will be standing beside you. And people have asked me, when you stand before God, what are you going to say? Here's what I've learned. Don't say nothing. Because <laughs> I sure could mess it up. And I understand, hey, I trusted you. I understand the Christian, you know, uh, words and language that we use. But Jesus is going to put his hand beside me and say, God, this one, this is one of yours. This is one of yours. And folks, the words after that I am longing to hear, well, well done, my good and my faithful servants. Well, folks, I thank God for the new covenant. The new covenant. And that covenant is perfect. 
And that place we are going is perfect. And our mediator is perfect. And heaven is perfect. Won't it be nice to have no temptation in heaven? Won't it be nice to be in a perfect place where there's no hate? Folks, you can feel hate here on earth. You can literally feel it. But it's not going to be that way in heaven. We are going to be with God in Jesus forever and ever and ever. This new covenant that we are talking about and the writer is talking about is complete, it is perfect, and it is eternal. Do you know anything else that is complete, perfect, and eternal? Hebrews 10, 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Folks, I am asking you today to strongly consider the words of Jesus Christ in the words written in our Holy Bible. Before you take the Lord's Supper, you need to be right with God. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. Nobody is that. We all mess up. We are all sinners according to the Bible. But even in 1 Corinthians, it tells us not to partake unworthily. Folks, please, during our time of invitation, would you do an inventory? Would you look at every part of your life? Would you look at the parts that sometimes we don't like to look at? And would you ask God to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And folks, I'm not talking about just, you know, uh, doing a blanket thing. God, I'm sorry. All right? I'm talking about internally, with God, seeing yourself how God sees you. Folks, this is what the Lord's Supper is about. And I want to say this. If I have offended you or hurt you in any way, I promise you I didn't mean to do it. Sometimes I just say things. But I publicly want to ask for your forgiveness. I publicly want to say I'm sorry. And I publicly want to say I'll do my best not to do it again. Even if later on you want to call me and just say, Mike, you did this. A lot of times, you know, I, don't, I didn't even know. Didn't even know. But I will give you a personal confession. I'll give you a personal identification of, I'm sorry, eye to eye if you want to. I just want our church to be right with God, to be right with our families, and to be right with our fellow men. Father, thank you for this day. And God, just thank you for your blood. Thank you that you loved us so much. You shed your blood and you gave your body for us. God, I pray that we would really look at our own lives. But I'm not trying to single anyone out, nobody. God, it's between you and them. But God, if you move on them and they want to come down to this altar and just pray, God, I pray they would feel free to do that. God, I thank you for what you have done. 
I thank You for the many blessings that You have given us. I thank You for how much You love us in spite of ourselves sometimes. God, I pray, I pray that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, everyone in this building will be right with You. God, I know to man it would seem impossible. But my Bible says with God all things are possible. God, I pray that you would do a work. Lord, however long it takes, whatever you want to do, God, this is your invitation and this is your time. God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? Shirley, this is Shirley Blair, and she has come today, and uh, she wants to join our church and move her membership here, and uh, she has a letter at the First Baptist Church in Amarillo, Texas, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, yeah, give her a hand. My, my grandparents lived in Amarillo, Texas, and I was sharing this uh, with Shirley earlier, and when I was young, we used to go there a lot, and so I'm you very. Been that close. <laughs> no, I go through there to go right. snow skiing. Oh. Yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, we're going to ask you uh, at the end of the service just to come back up here and let everybody greet you. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir.
All right, I'd like to ask the deacons who are helping with the service if you would come at this time. And I want to ask, uh, does everybody have a packet? Should be, if you are saved and you have been scripturally baptized, okay? Any left, just raise your hand up. Don't, don't be ashamed. We want you to be a part of this. Okay, over this way, if you would. Thank you, Landon. And if you see suits today... <laughs> That's, that's our deacons, okay? Lord's Supper Day, they need to be in suits. We need, I'm serious, folks. We need, to bring our, we need to bring our best to the Lord. This is God. This is, I am serious about that. Anyone else? All right. I want to read a couple of verses here before we actually do the Lord's Supper. It's 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and the body of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink, uh, drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And again, it says, let a man examine themselves. We are judging no one here today. All right? We do believe by doctrine that you need to be born again, that you need to have been immersed in water to take part of it. But again, if you're from another church and you're saved, if, if one of my sisters was here today and she wanted to partake of the Lord's Supper with us, I think she has every right to do that because she, she fulfills those qualifications. So you examine yourself on whether you are going to do this or not. Okay? All right. Guys, the Bible says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he betrayed, he took the bread. So if you'll just get inside your packet there, and you'll see two sides. Just unpeel the bread part, if you would, and just put it in your hand. Then it says, and, he, and when he had given some thanks, he took the bread. Don Crook, would you bless the bread as God's body? The Bible says, when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Now, if you would, get on the other side of your... Lord's Supper, and take the juice off. And let me give you a key here. Go slow, okay? Because it can splash out. Just go slow. We're not in a hurry. <clears throat> and when you're ready, would you just look up so I'll know that everybody is ready?
Okay, Richard, Johnson, would you pray and thank God for the blood of Jesus? I want to say that mankind tries to mimic what God creates. And folks, there's only one perfect blood. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. With all that's going on, I'm just telling you, they'll never get that. Because only Jesus Christ, he was the perfect lamb of God. And his blood took away our sin. Folks, I hope you understand. We are free. We are free because of the blood that was shed for you and I. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. There's the word. There's where I got my sermon title. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I've been asked occasionally, how do you know when we're going to take the Lord's Supper? And I know some people have kind of hinted around they'd like to do it more often. But here's the deal, folks. When God tells me to do it, we're going to do it. There are folks that do it every week, but I don't want it to become routine in our lives, folks. It is a special service. It is a special time together. And to share this day with you just makes it even more special. So thank you for being here today, and thank you for observing the Lord's Supper with us. Let me give you quickly some announcements. Adult choir at 5 o'clock today. We're going to have a mission service tonight. Uh, Bakri is heading to Africa and we have love offering envelopes at the exit. If you can't come back tonight, they're there. You can just slide them in our offering boxes. Or if you can come back tonight, uh, gee, we want to support him. Folks, he's the real deal on the mission field. He walks sometimes where he goes. All right. He, he's had malaria two or three times. And you see his slides, there's just lines of people waiting to be baptized. And uh, I would not ask you to do it if he wasn't the real deal. But he is the real deal. So if you could help him, and, and let's, let's give him a good uh, love offering. Prime, prime timers to the barn Thursday. Please sign up if you would. Wednesday, 6 p.m., children's back-to-school bash. Men's breakfast and Bible study this Saturday, and we'll do the outreach too. We'll do Bible study at uh, 8.30 and outreach at 10.30. Awana begins August the 23rd. And then I know we've already had a, a, a deal on a slide, but a baby Bible campaign all month long. Uh, the Heart to Heart, folks, it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry. Uh, you can do it one of two ways. I, I throw all my change in my ashtray, ashtray in my truck, so I put it, well, I don't smoke yet. What do y'all, <laughs> they make some use of it. <laughs> Something good can come out of an ashtray, okay? And so I put it in there, and here's what I do. And then I put a bill, a bill in there. Now, what size of bill you want to put in there, that's between you and God, okay? So my point is, it's a good cause, folks. Just give Give to these folks. They are doing a wonderful job and a wonderful ministry. All right, let's stand.
all right. Shirley, where, where did Shirley go? Can we move this back? Shirley, come on up. Hey, somebody come stand with Shirley, will you? Somebody just follow her down there, will you? All right, here we go. We got another one. Okay, super. That's okay. That's okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Charles, would you lead us as we go? Uh, Father, we love you, man, we praise you.